Yeah, I'm so excited to open up God's Word with you this evening. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4 after a little quick review from last week. But you know, I was thinking this week, it's happened to all of us before, and anyone who's a parent has been there, or even if you've worked with kids before, you've probably been there as well. The kids just won't stop fighting. Little Jane won't stop whining. Little Jack won't stop getting out of bed. It's been a long day. You've worked hard. You finally get the kids in bed. And, you know, little little Jackie just keeps getting up out of bed. And by the th fifth or sixth time, you've just had enough. And you're about to go crazy. Every parent has been there. I mean, sometimes it's enough to make you want to pull your hair up. I mean, that's what happened to me, right? <laughs> Tanya, that's what happened to me. It's enough to make you feel like you're going to lose your mind. And that's what happened to me, too. Have you seen it, Tanya? <laughs> Around here somewhere, it can make you do and say things that you said you would never do and say, things that your parents used to do and say. And then it happens. It starts out calm. Okay, everybody, please calm down. Please, can you keep it down? Let's all just get along. Then it ramps up a little bit. Kids, you need to stop now. You're really starting to get on my nerves. Can't keep it together much longer. If they don't stop, they can escalate rather quickly. Because I said so, and things like, don't make me come up there, or don't make me tell you one more time, and all of a sudden you get even madder because you realize those are the same things that your parents used to say, and you said, I'll never say those things to my kids, but you just said them to your kids, and it's all their fault because you made them say it. And then it happens, usually without warning. It just all bubbles up inside, and a primal scream utters from your lips, stop it! Just stop it, everyone! Just stop! Stop it! And everybody gets real quiet. They realize they crossed the line. And you finally got their attention. And hopefully, hopefully, maybe I've got your attention. 1 Corinthians 3 through 4. The Apostle Paul is sort of like that. He's like that exasperated parent who's just had enough. He's had enough. He's got reports from his spiritual children, the Christians in the church in Corinth, about division and disorder and unchecked, undisciplined sin uh, going on within the church. The body of Christ is a mess, is divided in disorder. In 1 Corinthians 1 through 6, the apostles' Holy Spirit inspired instructions are given on how to clean up that mess. And how to put things back in order. And if we could summarize in chapters 3 through 4 the basic command, the basic imperative of the Apostle Paul is pretty simple. Stop it! Just stop! All of you, just stop! He's like that exasperated parent. Stop dividing God's people. Stop destroying God's work. Stop being puffed up in pride. Like that exasperated parent who's had enough. He, he loves his kids and he wants what is best for them. But he's frustrated by constant bickering and fighting. And so he admonishes the Corinthian Christians as he admonishes us here at Montrose Baptist Church tonight. He admonishes us to unite around Christ to unite around those whose work is gospel ministry in the cause of the gospel, the growth of the kingdom of Christ. The basic summary of this section in 1 Corinthians is found in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. So the first problem that Paul addresses here is divisions in the church, and the divisions are around personalities. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas. Who is Cephas? Do you remember from last week? Another word for Peter. Yeah, Cephas is the Aramaic word for rock. Peter is the Greek word for rock. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church. And still others say, 
I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he goes on from there as we discussed last week. So they're divided around uh, personalities and loyalties. And it only makes sense, right? You're going to be loyal to the people who have invested themselves in you. You're going to be loyal to the people who have made a difference in your life, who have prayed for you, who have been there for you, who have raised you up in the faith. Maybe the person that baptized you or discipled you early on, or, or when you wandered away for a while, the person that helped guide you back and bring you back. So it only makes sense that you're going to have certain loyalties. The problem was these loyalties and these close relationships within the church were beginning to divide the church, and people were separating. Some said, well, I, I follow Paul. I mean, he's the founder of the church in Corinth. He's our spiritual father. I follow him. And others said, well, yeah, Paul's great, and we appreciate him, but, you know, he's kind of old hat. You know, he's not really that exciting anymore, but, but this Apollos guy, he's like a Greek orator. I mean, he's impressive, and he's really made a difference in our lives. And other people said, well, forget about Paul and Apollos. Jesus said to Peter, on this rock I will build my church. And Peter's the leader of, of the church, and so, you know, I follow him. And somebody else, you know, kind of being a little arrogant above the fray, well, oh, you follow Paul, Apollos, or Peter, but I, I follow Christ in the sense of arrogance and superiority. So Paul commands them, don't divide your loyalties, unite around the gospel. Our ultimate allegiance must be to Christ and to the message of the cross, where God's wisdom is displayed. So then we come forward to chapters 3 through 4, where Paul takes the principles that he's given us in chapters 1 through 2, principles that we discussed last week, and he applies them to the specific situation of the divided church in Corinth. Just as Paul and Apollos worked together for the advancement of the gospel, so the Corinthians should stop boasting about their favorite Christian leaders and start building a united church. That's the idea. It's working together around the gospel to build a united church. In these chapters, Paul takes a very strong, corrective tone. Remember, he's the spiritual father, the spiritual parent of this church in Corinth. And he takes a strong, strong corrective tone saying, Stop! What do you think you're doing? I said, stop it. Now, it's really hot in here right now. I don't know if we need to turn that down a little bit, because I have a feeling that pretty soon everybody's eyes nice. are going to start drooping. And as much as I want to be up here uh, teaching in a way that you have rest, I would. it's really hard to do when it's too hot in this environment. Thank you very much, sweetheart. I appreciate that. All right, so the first thing, the first thing that Paul addresses here is a big stop sign. Stop sign number one. Stop! Stop acting so Human. Stop acting so human. You may say, what? Wait, aren't, aren't we humans? I'm human, you're human, we're all human, right? But people begin to make excuses for themselves on that basis. And say things like, well, you know, it's just human nature. It's just human nature, it's just, you know, it's just how we are, just who I am, just human nature. But it's just human nature is no longer a valid excuse when you are indwelled by the Spirit of the living God. No longer a valid excuse. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3, Paul says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it, and even now you are still not ready. Essentially, he's saying, grow up already! Grow up already. You're still infants. You're still babes in your walk with Christ. It's time for you to mature. It's time for you to grow up. And what does it mean to grow up? Well, you've been redeemed, Paul says. Start acting like it. Verse 3. You are still of the flesh. And here's the evidence. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, or another, I follow Paulus, are you not... Being merely human. Wow. There are higher expectations for us as Christians who are indwelt by the Spirit of the living God. And if there is strife and quarreling among us, 
If we are living according to the flesh, just like everybody else, being merely human, it's time for us to stop. It's time for us to get back to the Word, get back to those practices that help grow our faith, help us mature in the faith, and to grow up already, as Paul says. We've been redeemed. We need to start acting like it. A second stop sign that Paul places here on the road for the Corinthians he says, stop destroying God's work by dividing over God's workers. The divisions that were going on in the Corinthian church were risking to hinder and even perhaps destroy the work that God was accomplishing. Verse 5, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Service through whom you believe does the Lord assign to each. I planted a palace water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So God makes all things grow. And because God makes all things grow, who gets all the glory? Us or God? God gets all the glory. We shouldn't put Christian leaders or famous Christian teachers and preachers, uh, maybe, maybe someone that we're particularly loyal to because of the impact they've had in our life, or maybe it's somebody who has an internet ministry or a radio ministry or some kind of thing like that. Uh, while we may be blessed by them and we should support them if we have been blessed by them, we shouldn't put them up on some kind of pedestal and begin to honor them in ways that are inappropriate or begin to even perhaps worship them in ways that are inappropriate. But rather, we need to remember that God is the one who makes all things grow. And so he equips his people to spread the seed of the word of God. But it is God who provides the growth. It is God who provides the growth. Christian teachers and preachers and personalities are fellow workers together. And the people amongst whom they minister are God's field and God's building. Who will judge the leadership, stewardship of Christ's service? Well, we see in verses three, chapter 3, verses 10 and following, that it is God who will judge. Chapter 3, verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon. So Paul, specifically in the situation in Corinth, was the one who brought the gospel there and laid a foundation for the gospel in preaching the cross of Jesus Christ and salvation through Christ and Christ alone. <laughs> Others, like Apollos, come behind Paul and begin to build upon that foundation. Paul says, let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds in the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest and they will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he would receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, so he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. God is going to judge the leadership or the stewardship of Christ's ministers, of his servants. And while in the context here, the primary thought is about Christian leaders and ministers and teachers, it applies to all who are given great grace gifts by God to help build up the church. So that means this applies to all Christians and our stewardship of the resources God has given to us, specifically as Paul says in verse 10, the grace of God given us to help lay a foundation in Jesus Christ and build up the church upon that sure foundation. So what we're talking about here is the judgment seat of Christ. Everybody say that with me. The judgment seat of Christ. And our first question might be, when will God evaluate our work? The simple answer is he will evaluate our work at the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Talking to Christians. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. The judgment seat of Christ is not what we encounter in the final chapters of Revelation, the great white throne judgment. So as believers, we have been redeemed. 
We have crossed over from death unto life. We have been saved. We no longer have fear of God's wrath. We're not talking about judgment in terms of heaven or hell. For us as believers in Jesus Christ, hell is canceled. Heaven is guaranteed. We need not live in fear of the wrath of God. So what are we talking about? Judgment seat of Christ. We're talking about evaluation of our stewardship. We're talking about like the parable of the talents where a certain amount is entrusted to each of the three individuals and the two who take what's entrusted to them and they make it grow and they multiply it, they wisely invest it so that they can give it back to the master when he returns not only what they receive but twice and more, they are blessed. The person who takes their talent, what they are given, buries it in the ground, is not blessed does not hear those wonderful words, well done, good and faithful servant. We're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14.10 says, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Interestingly, as we've been learning on Wednesday nights, there in Romans 14, he's talking to Christians who disagree about debatable matters and debatable practices that Christians may or may not engage in. And to those who, as he describes it, have weaker faith and are not able to participate in certain things within the society at large, he says, don't judge your brother. To those who are able to participate with a clear conscience, he says, don't despise those who are weaker. Because it's before God that we will be judged. At the judgment seat of Christ, we will stand before him and be evaluated. Now remember, we need not fear the judgment seat of Christ. By grace through faith, because of Jesus Christ, we are right with God. We will not face condemnation or wrath upon that final day. Therefore, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the next question is, if God's going to evaluate our work at the judgment seat of Christ, how will God evaluate our work? Well, two questions, and it's much like a building inspector might evaluate the soundness and quality of a building. So a building inspector comes through, let's say you're getting ready to buy a house, and the building inspector comes and takes a look at the house. What's one of the first things about the house, one of the most important things the building inspector is going to take a real close look at? He's going to take a, he or she's going to take a close look at the foundation. So, did we lay a sure foundation? Did we lay a sure foundation? That foundation laid must be Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul says in verse 11, No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's what he was talking about in chapters 1 and 2. The message of Christ, the message of the cross. He says, I desire to know nothing among you except Christ and Him crucified. He laid a sure foundation. Not upon flowery oratory, not upon telling jokes, uh, not upon all kinds of things that sometimes we begin to emphasize in church life. He laid a foundation in the good news of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose on the third day, that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the foundation that Paul laid on Jesus Christ. A building is only as solid as its foundation. We're familiar with the story Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 7 about people who built houses. One person built his house upon the rock, and where the other person built his house? Sand. Upon the sand. The person who built his house upon the rock is like one who builds the foundation of their life upon obedience to the word of Christ. One who hears and puts into practice the words of Jesus. The one who builds their house upon the sand is like someone who builds the structure of their lives upon not obeying the words of Jesus, like someone who hears the words of Jesus but does not put them in to practice, doesn't make any difference. What happens when the wind and the waves begin to howl, when the storms of life begin to swirl? The person whose house is built upon the rock stands strong because he has a sure foundation. The person whose house is built upon the sand, their house crumbles down. There's nothing to show so when building a house, what happens first? Well, first debris and trees need to be cleared. That might be akin to repentance and turning away from our sin, getting 
seeking to separate ourselves from some of the junk in our lives. Then the lot needs to be leveled, the basement dug, the foundation poured. This process can take a, a long time depending on the type of structure to be built upon it. If you're going to build a skyscraper, you're going to take months and months to build a deep foundation, maybe all the way down to, to bedrock, and maybe, you know, it's going to take a long time to lay that sure foundation for a mighty building to be built upon it. What foundation are you building upon? The scripture is clear. If you're building upon any foundation other than Jesus Christ, when the storms of life begin to howl and rage and the winds begin to blow and the waves begin to crash, if you're not building upon the sure foundation of Jesus, you can expect a loud crash of all that you have built. Second question. Did we build with the right materials? So that building inspector will only check out the foundation of the home. He or she might also check out the building materials that were used. Are they quality materials? Was the home built in a, in a sure and secure kind of way? So 1 Corinthians 3 verse 12, If anyone builds on the foundation of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest, the day will disclose it. It will be revealed by fire, the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So, gold, silver, precious stones will survive the test of fire. Wood, hay, and straw, what will happen to them? Just be consumed, be burnt up, nothing to show for it. Wood, hay, or straw would be uh, works done with uh, poor motives, works done in strife and disunity. Here in the context, works done in bickering and jealousy, works done in competition with other Christians. Those uh, gold, silver, precious stones would represent hearing and obeying the words of Jesus with a clear conscience, with right motives, seeking God's glory, the good of the church, the advancement of the gospel. Those are works done as good gold, silver, and precious stones. On that day of testing by fire, the judgment seat of Christ, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Now we don't have time tonight to go into extensively what these rewards might be. There's a lot of different questions about what the rewards are. Is it some kind of crown in heaven? Is it in the heavenly kingdom some kind of uh, increased authority or governance or something like that? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what these rewards are. They're wonderful things and some people, though themselves saved, it says if anyone's work is burned up, verse 15, he will suffer loss, so he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. The picture there. Somebody has spent their entire life building this house. But at the very end, a raging fire consumes everything. The person caught in the house that is on fire runs out the front door, falls into the paramedic's arms. That person is saved. But as they turn around and look back at all they spent their entire life building up, there is nothing to show for it. Because it was all wood, hay, and straw wasn't valuable, wasn't worth anything. It was built upon the stuff of the flesh, the stuff of this world. Merely human behavior is not built upon life in the spirit, living for the glory of God and the good of others. I don't know about you, but I don't want to come to that day and have everything I invested my entire earthly life in shown to be of no value whatsoever. Let us build with valuable building materials, gold, silver, precious stones. Interestingly, in 1 Chronicles 29, Solomon's temple is described as being built with gold, silver, and precious stones. And what's the very next thing we encounter in verse 16? Do you not know that you are God's temple, and that God's Spirit dwells in you? You, plural, gathered as the local church, the local body of Christ. You are God's temple. God's Spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. The word destroy here, this is talking about ultimate punishment. Ultimate judgment from God. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. A person who seeks to destroy and tear down the temple of the Holy Spirit shows himself or herself not to be a genuine believer or follower in Christ and will face destruction. Did we lay a sure foundation? Did we build with the right materials? And how should we evaluate our work? Do we do it in a way of worldly wisdom or with a divine 
perspective. Verse 18 of chapter 3, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. I was circled that verse in your Bible. I underlined it to start it in mind. The wisdom of this world is folly with God. We need a different perspective. And if we're just getting a constant feed of worldly wisdom in our minds and in our hearts, then we are living foolish lives before God. We need God's wisdom, God's truth, which comes from God's word. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas of the world or life or death, the present or the future, all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. This is a divine perspective that every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. We need to evaluate our work from God's perspective, not from the perspective of worldly wisdom. And how then should we think of Christian workers as we seek to evaluate them? Well, Paul says, consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Chapter 4, verse 1, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. You know, sometimes when we serve, when we work to build up the body of Christ or to share the good news of Jesus, I think sometimes before God we take an attitude of, wow, God, I bet you're really grateful for my service. And didn't I do something wonderful before you, God? And isn't that great? And not that we shouldn't feel good about our service, but sometimes we take a posture of almost arrogance and pride about the service that we are rendered to the Lord. And I love how Jesus just deflates the air of our, out of our tires in Luke chapter 17. He says in verse 10, Luke 17, 10, So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. That was Paul's perspective. He says, woe unto me if I don't proclaim the gospel. Who am I not to do that which God has called me and gifted me to do? So he says, how should you regard us? Don't put us up on a pedestal. We're just servants of Christ. We're just doing what he called us to do. We're stewards entrusted with the mysteries of God. Those things which are revealed in the writings of the prophets and the apostles. He also says that the ultimate criterion of success in Christian ministry is not sometimes what we think. Sometimes we think about what some people call the three B's. Uh, buildings, budgets, and butts in the pew. And that's how you establish a successful ministry. What, how big is your building? How big is your budget? How many people are in your pews that come to church on Sunday? What is the ultimate criterion of success? Faithfulness. Faithfulness, verse 2. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found what? That they be found faithful. With me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, Paul says. I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, not to go beyond Scripture, that none of you may be puffed up in favor against one another. And we come to our final stop sign here in the text. The Apostle Paul says, Stop! Stop being puffed up in pride over gifts that God has graciously given and that you have freely received. Isn't that the folly of pride? That we would become puffed up in pride over spiritual gifts and abilities and talents that God has graciously given to us that we have freely and humbly received and that somehow we'll become puffed up in pride over these things against one another? You and I can take credit for nothing. He says... For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? 
If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? We can't take credit for anything except sin and its consequences. That's what we can take credit for. The wages of sin is death. That's our part. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All we did was mess things up. And all God did was everything. So we can take credit for nothing before God. Being puffed up in pride is just plain silly and foolish. And we can learn a lot from the Apostle's personal experience. He goes on here in chapter 4 to describe the humility of the Apostles. And we learn from his example that only the conquered will take up their cross and follow Jesus. Paul describes himself and the other Apostles in verse 9 like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, they're led in triumphal procession. It's a picture of a Roman general who would travel to another place and conquer that people. And then amongst the prisoners of war and those that were alive and left, and amongst the generals and the leaders, they would be paraded through the streets of Rome, through the Arc de Triomphe, which, which is now in Paris, They'd be paraded through the streets of Rome. And people would jeer and people would cheer for the Romans. They would jeer the conquered foe. And many times they were led to public executions or perhaps led to the arena where they would be slaughtered by gladiators or beasts. Paul says that's kind of like us. We're led by Christ in triumphal procession. We've been conquered by Christ. It's a stance of humility and service to Christ. And I love how Paul concludes this section. He says in verse 16, I urge you, be imitators of me. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you have not many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. How many of you said it to somebody this week? You look them right in the eye and you said, look, your life's a little bit of a mess right now. Here's what you need to do. Just imitate me. Just do what I do and you're going to be okay. Anybody said it to somebody? Maybe never once in your entire lifetime. You know, we as parents, what do we like to say? Do as I say, not as I do. <coughs> chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. Well, no chuckling about it. We need to say, do as I say and as I do. That's what Paul says. Imitate me. Do as I say and as you have seen me do. Imitate me. I'm your spiritual father, after all. I'm the one who laid the foundation of Jesus Christ upon which others are building. I'm your spiritual parent, your spiritual father. Be imitators of me. And then he goes on to remind them that he is coming and he will confront those who are creating problems. And while they may be all about talk, he is going to come with power. And he's going to come with the rod of discipline. Discipline in love, but still the rod of discipline. Only the faithful follow the fatherly example of their four. Runners, be imitators of me. I count one, two, three, four, five, six times in his writings where Paul essentially says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And I pray that we might have leaders in our churches. I pray that I might be a leader who can confidently and boldly and humbly say, follow my example. Don't just do as I say, do as I do. But in order for us to be that common, we have to practice what we preach. So like an exasperated parent here in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul admonishes his spiritual children to stop. Just stop. Stop dividing God's people. Stop destroying God's work. Stop being puffed up in pride. And I would say, what about you? What about our church? In what ways are we acting altogether human and of the flesh. I don't know about you, but I can resonate a lot with the Apostle Paul when he says, I will come to you soon if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. 
Maybe you're tired of church just being all about talk. The power of which Paul speaks is the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of changed lives, transformed eternities. This, this is what we ought to long for and what we ought to pray for as Christians. And yet, we who are indwelt by the Spirit of the living God are acting as mere humans. And we make excuses for ourselves because it's just human nature. It's just the way we are. Well, that's no longer a valid excuse. And so Scripture says to us, stop. Stop. Grow up already. Stop foolishly boasting. Start humbly serving. And remember, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes all things grow. God gets all the glory as God does his work. So seek God's glory. Seek the good of his church. And seek the advancement of the gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gracious Father in heaven, I thank you for your word to us tonight. Indeed, we ask that you will help us to grow up in our most holy faith. That the seed of your word will find good soil in our hearts. That it will grow true and strong and and bear fruit, the fruit of good works and the fruit of uh, reproducing and changed lives as the gospel is proclaimed and people believe and receive and become children of God and dwelt by the spirit of the living God. God, help us to no longer live in a merely human way, but to live as people who are indwelt, empowered, changed from the inside out by the Holy Spirit. May it be seen in evidence in our love for one another, in our commitment to the good news of Jesus Christ, even as we follow the positive examples of those who have gone before us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And um, our closing song tonight is for a prairie God, saying, God, you are my God, I will ever praise you. I will seek you in the morning, I will learn to walk in your ways. And step by step, you'll lead me, and I will follow you all of my days. <laughs>